If you've been thinking about becoming a member, now is the time. For the rest of the month, receive $10 off an annual membership. Members receive an ad-free listening experience, members-only bonus content, an invitation to join the DSR Network Slack community, a members-only newsletter, and members-only blog posts. To take advantage of this offer, visit thedsrnetwork.com slash buy, select the annual option, and enter code December 2022 at checkout. That's thedsrnetwork.com slash buy and enter code December 2022 at checkout. Happy holidays. Nine, 12, 10, 28, 2, 23. This is Deep State Radio, coming to you direct from our super-secret studio in the third sub-basement of the Ministry of SNARK in Washington, D.C., and from other undisclosed locations across America and around the world. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Uh, It's that time of the week to talk about politics, and we are here with our friends Simon Rosenberg of NDN and Tara McGowan of her multiple media empires. And I want to talk a little bit about how the the lay of the land is changing from a a media and communications point of view, what with Elon Musk and so on and so forth. But I want to ease into it with just a couple of headline stories, ask you each a response to a quick headline story, and then we'll get into that in two minutes. But I think people want to understand this. Simon, Kristen Cinema, explain this to us, please. I don't think there is an easy explanation for it. I think we'll learn more whether this is a negotiation of some kind, uh, whether she's really going to work against the party in 2024, whether she's running again. Certainly, you know, we had a terrific election. I don't think this should in any way diminish the import of what we all just did together. The party is very strong, but we still have a lot of work to do. You know, and this is we've got a tough election ahead of us in 2024, an election of of enormous opportunity for us, where I think we could once again control all three, you know, the House, the Senate and the presidency if we have a good election. But I I think that we shouldn't let this is going to get worked out. I mean, this is going to become a a backdrop for the next six to nine months. We'll see. I'm not convinced she's running again. I mean, I just want to say my opinion is that I, I don't know that she's acting as if she's going to run again. And I don't think we should assume that we know the answer to that for now. But she's is she she is she follows her own drummer, and we'll see what happens. Okay, second breaking news question before we get into our topic, but it's a bridge into our topic, and I'm so glad you're here, Tara, to discuss this. The former president of the United States made a huge announcement today, touted it for the past 24 hours and announced that he's launching a line of NFT trading cards that depict Donald Trump as Superman, among other things. Uh, And I just want to know, because you really got your finger on the pulse, how many of these you've purchased since the announcement? Zero, uh, with no plans to. Uh, This is very on brand for Trump, right? I mean, it's self-aggrandizing. It's scammy. It's probably going to raise him a lot of money among his very, very dedicated base. It's an interesting time to be launching an NFT campaign. I know that those haven't been uh, fully sort of um, revealed to not be a, a, a standing or sustaining movement. I think it's interesting, but uh, it's it just feels like another desperate plea for attention and fundraising. So sad. So, so sad. But it does... Uh get us into our topic, which is that the technological landscape for politics in America is changing. I think Donald Trump is once again misreading it, as he did with Truth Social. Simon, you and I have talked about this for many, many years. You have really been trying to stay abreast of how technology is changing things. And as we talked about in the run-up to this election, social media, passive news consumption, interactive platforms all are playing a bigger and bigger role, and yet they are changing dramatically. Uh, And the entrance into all of this of Elon Musk, who has, uh, I think it's fair to say, 
lived up to every negative expectation that people had about his takeover of Twitter, seen the site flooded with racism, and uh, changed the rules to make it a platform where disinformation is likely to flourish, suggests further changes are in store. What do you think the significance of the of the Musk moves are, and how does this play into the changing atmosphere for the next couple of years? Yeah, so three points on that. One is that as a context, despite Biden's low approval rating, inflation being high, Russia and Saudi Arabia trying to intervene in the election, all the things that we know that were made this election difficult for Democrats, Democrats actually gained ground in seven of the major battleground states. We show that when we have our robust campaigns and control the information environment and run our grassroots operations, that we can not only hold our ground, but we can actually gain ground in a very adversarial circumstance. Outside of the battleground, however, we lost ground. And I think that the good news is that when we show we can control the information environment, we can prosper. When we don't control the information environment, they prosper. And they're much louder than we are. And, and so I think that while there's a lot of good news in this election, there's also this ongoing warning sign for all of us that there is a, an information asymmetry. They are just simply louder than we are. They have far greater capacity to take their memes and their arguments and push them into the national discourse. My favorite example of that that I talk about all the time is the fentanyl and Halloween candy, which was always among the most absurd things that we've ever heard, but it became something that was being openly discussed by the RNC chairwoman in the final few weeks before Halloween and the election. So I think one thing, that this election is it's like a warning sign to us that we have to get more intentional about control, you know, about competing more aggressively in the information environment. The second piece of that is that we have to not be naive about the nature of the conflict that we're in here, right, about the information war that we're in. We've seen Politico and CNN move to the right in the last few months, being acquired by people openly associated with, you know, the far right movements in the United States. We've now seen Twitter, which was arguably our, one of our most important places where we gathered and did our work, you know, being taken away or degraded, whatever it is. And it just means, to your point about change, change has been the constant in, the, in this new media world. We used to, we called it new media 20 years ago, right? But chain has been the constant. Every two years, there's a completely different media landscape. And what's going to happen now, and part of the reason I'm so excited Tara's with us today and the work that she does at Courier Newsroom, is that I think we have to view the degradation of Twitter as an opportunity and not as a tragedy. This is going to, we are going to have to move beyond Twitter in the next six months. I mean, we don't, we can't rely on it anymore. It's a place that doesn't share our values any longer. It's it's just not a place that we're going to be able to rely on as a primary way of our, as a gathering place for us. But that creates enormous opportunity for Deep State Radio, for Midas Touch, for Resolute Square, for Courier Newsroom, for many entrepreneurs and innovators who can help define what this next space is going to be. And, and I'm, I'm actually growing more op optimistic that we can have a collective and strategic response to what's happening here with Twitter and with, in general, the information asymmetry that exists in the country. And with that, I want to turn it to one of the people who's actually trying to do this in her day-to-day -day work. I was very excited. This was our topic du jour, since this is my entire world. I've been studying the shifting media ecosystem since I was in college at NYU Journalism School and did media theory there in addition to journalism. And it, it, I'm a digital native. I grew up on the internet. I've been on the internet since I was about 10 years old. So I do remember a time before it, though very few memories. But it, you're exactly right, Simon, that the pace of revolution, the pace of innovation and disruption in media is so much faster than it ever was in pre previous generations. And social media, really, the internet obviously decentralized media and democratized it in huge ways. Social media did that again. And then, of course, the introduction of algorithms put us in a very different place. And built a really, really, really profitable disinformation economy. And so we have, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of opportunities, but we are in another very disruptive moment right now. And this one feels much more precarious than some of the others. Um, in other ways, 
in the past when there've been innovations like the on like the very rapid rise of Facebook at the beginning it was pretty good. You we were hearing about good things coming out of organizing on the platform and connecting the world and things like the Arab Spring and um things of that nature where people were really able to organize and support globally different efforts and activism and then of course we all know what's happened and what Facebook has done to our country with its growth and its success. But in this moment we're in right now what gives me great concern is that ownership of media is probably never been more important than now because we have essentially eliminated the sort of standard unified embracing of separation of church and state between news and profit and news and business side and i don't think that's necessarily all of a bad thing which i can talk about it's very much something we took into account when we structured career my news network but what we're seeing is we're seeing people with really 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 explicit social ideological or frankly just greedy agendas and objectives taking over these massive information distribution platforms and putting their thumb on the scale and 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 Elon Musk is the is the is obviously the most clear example of this he spent 44 billion dollars to take over a massive megaphone and make himself the news of the day every day the way that Trump did for free and it works. That's how quickly the conversation in the national media shifted around him when he was able to take over that platform and essentially implode it. I think that these things will come and go, but the role of the people that have the control over this and the, and the fact that we don't have regulation, I believe today is the day, the last day for pressure for Congress and the Senate to, to take on the big tech regulatory measures. We haven't seen the political will for this. And so it, and we no longer have the fairness doctrine in this country. So that's what really worries me is that there aren't universal standards or even ethics any longer when it comes to news and information distribution. The opportunity there is that it is so decentralized that it is about owning properties. It is about building trust with smaller communities and audiences. And that's where you're going to have the greatest impact because that's where you're going to build trust. The right understands this intimately. They have been building trust and evangelizing communities in, in niche outlets and niche communities online for decades now. And the left has just been very, very slow to understand the evolving ecosystem and embrace it. They're still relying on the traditional filter bubble of the traditional media to get their message across when you can communicate it directly. And, and they've made a lot of progress, but building media is something I've been very passionate about for a long time because there is no one else who can tell our stories better. And we cannot wait for other people to tell our stories. And we can do it in line with our values, with facts and with ethical standards and guidelines like we have at Career. So it's not a bad thing to have, for instance, partisan media or ideological media, as long as you are transparent about who you are and what you stand for. I think that's critical. But also it's just the reality of media today is that we have to be building our own spaces and platforms and properties to be able to engage and inform audiences and not just talk to our base. That is a really important thing. Like we need to have those media. I think crooked media is excellent. I think so many things are, are, are really doing a good job of organizing and communicating and evangelizing the progressive base or the existing, you know, most likely voter activist base. That's so important. But we have to remember that a vast majority of the population actually shares a lot of our values and do not associate with the party and do not and are not very actively engaged. And they're the ones who are left behind and most susceptible to the bad actors who want to manipulate and sow trust, uh, mistrust with them and division. And so we just have to take it more into our hands. And that's, I mean, certainly something that I'm trying to do, but I think it's something we need to encourage and make much more popular in funding and stakeholder and power circles. So as I look at this, it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated landscape. There are deeply worrisome signs on the horizon. Eight of the 10 largest media companies are owned by figures who lean right or libertarian. That, you know, those media companies control an increasingly large segment of media traffic, communications traffic, the amount of people, people get from, from news. Uh, there are technological trends afoot that are deeply worrisome as well. We've seen a lot in the past week about AI chatbots, but you know the, the the reality is that over the course of the next couple of years, you're likely to see an avalanche of content that is created by machines 
machines, of course, are created by people, but that you can actually, to use the Steve Bannon term, flood the zone with disinformation or distractions or confusion. You, you can talk about deep fakes. There are other kinds of technological developments that are certain to change this picture in the next uh, several years. By the same token, we live in a world of distributed media. And as we've talked about here, every individual has a platform, which isn't true before. And individuals can arrive on the scene and have an impact quickly. You know, we've seen the Midas touch people come during COVID and set themselves up and have an impact. You've had an impact with what you're doing, Tara, the crooked media came. I mean, we have the, I always say we have the world's smallest media company, but you know, we have between six, 700,000 downloads a month. We expect in the next few months to hit a million downloads a month. That's much bigger. When I used to be the editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, and it was 50 years old, we had nowhere near that kind of bandwidth impact on people because everybody spends 45 minutes per podcast listening to it. So the relationship is different. And, and there are these qualitative issues also. Our producer here, Grant Haver, uses the term parasocial. These are parasocial relationships when you get into podcasts and these other kinds of things. People have relationships with the people. They listen to them. They drive to work with them. They go to the gym with them. It's not the same as a newsreader used to be or, or a neutral headline. And so there's opportunities in here, and there's a great deal of peril. There's a government that's unlikely to take action. I, I, by the way, I just add to this. I noted today that the governor of Georgia signed something saying TikTok cannot be used in, in states. Uh, there is a discussion in the Congress to ban TikTok from being used on government equipment because it's run by or influenced by and, and Chinese government people who will have access to that information. So there, there's that whole set of issues. Governor and, of Iowa, Tim Reynolds, also banned it from uh, Iowa government, state government. I wouldn't be surprised if that's a, a nationwide band in, 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 in no time at all. And TikTok's a very powerful tool, so that, has a, that colors it. How, Simon, does an individual navigate this? I mean, there are two perspectives, right? One is the individual. One is the organizer, the party, the, you know, how, do, how do people create an impact? But let's start with the individual. How do you make sense of this? How do you deal with the fact that you trusted Twitter and you can't anymore? You can't trust TikTok, you, you know, and there's an AI chatbot in your future. I do think that one of the biggest differences between the right, the center right and the center left, and there really is not a center right anymore, just the right, is that there was an effort to get people on the right to understand that they played a role in the information war. You had a role as an amplifier, that you were engaged in the conversation, and that what you did with the information you were receiving and the way that you spread it to your networks was important because there was this narrative, the mainstream media was controlled by the Democrats. And so we had to go build our own thing, and we had to amplify our own means and our own stories. It's why Fox News, right, fair and balanced, I mean, all this stuff. So this has been ingrained into the modern right for decades that we can't rely on that media out there. we got to build our own, right, and we got to amplify, and, we, and that each person has a role to play. Well, that's the same thing that's really true on our side. Everyone who's listening to this, you are part of this information discussion. And that we have to start understanding that this information discussion, the, I don't like the term war, but it's sort of the, the most, it's the most accurate right now. But this information war is being fought out 24-7, 365 every day. And that they're beating us most days, right? They're beating us most days. Not every day, uh, but they're beating us most days. And everyone who's listening can play a role in this, right? You can get more subscribers for Deep State. You can, when you hear a segment you really like, you can send it out. When you see Joe Biden doing something you like, you share it with your friends. We have to become more purposefully amplified and networked as a response to what they built. And one of my basic proposals is I helped create the War Room 30 years ago with 20 people in a headquarters sweating it out in a small room in Little Rock, Arkansas, 
the new idea of a war room should be 4 million people wired into the DNC, getting information and spreading it through their networks every day. We, this is something that we can do that's within our power to do in the next six to nine months. This is not a high in the sky thing where we need to build our own Fox News that may take a decade. The second thing I just want to say is that the other thing I've become very convinced about, and David, I had one of these crazy media moments, right? I had 100 million Twitter views between early October and mid-November. So I was I became like a major media property just as a private citizen, just a guy, right? Out there. You know, was that was that out. a dance you did on TikTok? <laughs> no TikTok. But the point was to your it's getting to something you mentioned and and the power of a private individual, right? I was just a guy. And I reached a hundred I had a hundred million views in a very short period of time because I had an argument and something to say and I was networked. But the key thing, the other piece of this is that I think we also have to become very intentional about positive sentiment. I become very convinced that what a lot of what MAGA does and greater MAGA, and I mean greater MAGA, the MAGA here, Putin, the illiberal international in our global discourse, they put negative sentiment into our discourse. They want us to feel less good about our country, our leaders, ourselves, our institutions, our parties, each other. Right. They want us to feel bad about America. They want us to feel bad about the American project, about democracy. And part of our response has to be put hot to counter that negative sentiment with positive sentiment. It is really critical. I've really come to my mind on this has really changed in the last few months, where I think the intelligence community, David, in 2017, when they did their first report on the Russia effort in the 2016 election, said that their goal was to sow discord in America. I don't actually think that's true anymore, in my view. I think the more accurate way of understanding this is that they're trying to create negative sentiment in the United States, and that part of the center left, if we're going to prevail over authoritarian impulses here and around the world, is that we have to become more intentional about not just winning the information war, but also winning it with positive sentiment and telling the positive stories about our progress and all the good things that we've done and about the virtues of democracy and not feel like we're being Pollyannish. And not feel like we're being, you know, like cheerleaders, happy cheerleaders on the side, right? I'm happy to be a purveyor of hopium. I, I'm, I'm proudly endorse and embrace my role as a hopium uh, dealer in democratic politics. We need far more of it. And, and I think these are the, some of the things that I've learned in this battle over the last few months in particular. This is where we take a break and we tell the people who've been listening in the general public that if you want to keep listening, you should be a member and uh, go to the dsrnetwork.com and click on membership. And for those of you who are members, just stay right where you are. Keep listening because we'll be back with Tara and more on all of this in a moment. 